Welcome to Just the Tipsters podcast. My name is Melissa Morgan. I'm the host, and this is my beautiful co-host, Angelique Perrin, who is joining me today after a small respite where she was out of town for a while. How was your trip, Angelique? My trip was beautifully relaxing. You did say that? That's why it took me so long to come back. Yeah. Oh, so the story was... This was the story oh. that it was on Twitter. People were going crazy at the rumor oh, that Snickers, no, that Snickers removed the dick vein. Removed the dick vein. It's the funniest thread I've ever read in my life. I sent it to three people last night. Okay. The people who responded, the, the companies that were Skittles, uh, no veins here. We're smooth as silk. But I like the vein. Number one, it wasn't a Snickers. It was a fucking Snickers ice cream bar. And somebody put it in the, Uh, it was a, it was a Well, it was a, the story was fake. The story wasn't fake. The person faked it. Yes. Right, right, right. So first of all, like I hate Twitter. It's stupid. The only thing that it's, unless you're famous, it's stupid. The only thing it's good for is if you're famous and you know, you can talk to hundreds of millions of people and everyone gives a shit about what you say. If you're a regular human being, it's like you're yelling into a canyon. Nobody cares. But there are certain businesses that make life worth living. One of them is Wendy's, who will talk fucking smack about every other. I love Wendy's. Oh, Their Twitter people are hilarious. They are. It was the businesses that responded. And then there was that one that one guy who, who just wrote the word cock. And the Snickers <laughs> people said, there's no, there's no, Chicken, chicken and Snickers, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so no let me think here. Dickin. <laughs> yeah, Fle- Fleshlight. Someone named Fleshlight said, "Okay, I like it, Picasso." And then Snickers said, "I know you see it. Get it, Fleshlight." M and M's. Maybe this just should have stayed in the draft. Pizza Hut. The way we ran to see these replies, Snickers said, "Glad you came where the nuts reside." <laughs> to Pizza Hut. I mean, oh God, Starburst. This seems juicy for Twitter. <laughs> Snickers said, you don't even know the half of it. Skittles. Don't worry. We don't, we don't have Skittles veins. We're 100% smooth. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah that's, cute. that it's was cute. priceless. Yeah. By the way, I do have to say this. Uh, most people know my dislike for the state of Florida. Sorry, Florida. Not sorry. Florida and Texas, if they would kind of just go back to wherever, like if, if Texas would just secede from the union and, go, and union and go back to Mexico, terrific. If Florida maybe fell off and went into the Gulf, fine, totally fine. I think we'd get, get by just great with, you know, 46 contiguous states. Right. So, um, someone mentioned, I, and I have these friends who I adore that want to move eventually to a place called the villages, which Ooh. is do you know? Yes, of okay. course. Everybody, Everybody knows, knows. Villages now. All right. I feel a little ignorant, but oh, all right. Okay. So I, I've got like their parent, her parents live there and she, when she retires with her fiance, they want to live there. And I'm like, no, no. Cause I'll never come and see you. I'll never come and see you. So a friend recommended a documentary called a little piece of heaven. Oh my gosh. You're shaking your head. No, Have you seen I it? haven't seen it, but I've heard about it. Okay. Angelique, it's awful and i think she thought it would maybe make me feel better and it made me feel so much worse it's it's terrible and darren aronofsky is one of the producers who you know has kind of a a very fascinating eye and has done some very exquisite films so this being a documentary was um i will have to say it's beautifully shot there are some exquisite scenes, scenes you don't understand. Like there are so many activities at this city. It's basically a city for people 55 and older. And some of them are, you know, maybe you don't make a lot of sense. Like, um, you know, those, uh, those beautiful Asian dances with like long, like kimonos with long sleeves. Mm-hmm. So they have a group of women wearing these beautiful long sleeved kimonos dancing to to Dean Martin singing, um, let it snow. What happens in my brain is that it becomes very disconnected, um, because of, I don't know what the fuck's happening. And then there is a Lothario, an 81 year old Lothario who lives in his van and tries the villages. Yep. And he gets, you know, kind of like rousted every now and then, like you can't park here. You don't live here and he'll move to a different area. And he, and he has a plan. He wants to find 
um, you know, a, uh-huh, he, as he calls it. Yeah, he calls it a chick. I want to find a chick to take care of me. And my friend Melissa gave me the absolute best description. A lot of these, I think they call them condo cowboys who are looking. And you know what they're looking for? A nurse with a purse. I actually thought I would shit in my britches. <laughs> I was laughing so hard. Condo cowboys looking for a nurse, a nurse with a purse. Yeah. So I'm howling laughing at, you know, this until I watch this documentary and I'm like, oh no. So he's preternaturally tanned into the shade of like um, a leather baseball glove Ew. and a lot of gold jewelry. Oh boy. F- uh, uh, Hawaiian shirts. Please let there be chest hair. A lot of it. Mm. White. Mm. It's really not good. He has a full head of hair. Um, and a bunch of chest hair. And the only reason I know that besides the unbuttoned shirts, it's Hawaii and it's humid. He takes a shower at the pools out in public early in the morning before dawn or late at night, naked of out course. in the, you know, the showers you yeah. take when you get out of the pool. Only way he, you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you live in your van. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he, and he had a plan. He was like, so I, I first I hung out, I, I guess at some of the activities trying to find someone and it wasn't working. And then I went to church kind of trying to find, and that wasn't working, but I'm having good luck at the pools. And I don't think it's because he's showering and naked there because he usually does that before anyone else arrives, but he's finding a nurse, trying to find a nurse with a purse at the pools. And he did find someone. There's a very sad, in my mind, very sad scene where he's sitting in his van and he's got a flip phone, which is also sad. And he's, (laughs) he's going through his contact list to try and find someone to stay with. And He finds someone and he's like, so can you help me out? And then he shows up at this older woman's home, like tall and thin, kind of light hair, might be blonde. I don't know. And, you know, you can tell it's, it's just not going to last. And he, he actually leaves, but he's moving his, his things in at first. You're hoping maybe they'll be together to help each other. And all of his items, his worldly goods are in plastic tubs like Rubbermaid tubs with lids. Mm -hmm. So he's moving his plastic tubs into this woman's house and they're sitting there and she's like, what would you like for lunch? And you see the look on his face like, (sighs) so she makes like cucumber and peanut butter sandwiches or whatever. But my favorite scene is when they're getting dressed for an event of some sort. And she has like a pink cowboy hat with sequins all over it. And he's wearing like a, uh, an American flag shirt that looks like like a belly shirt from like 1976. If he were uh, a member of, you know, um, who were the guys that sang YMCA? (laughs) The village. Yeah. The village people. It's like, he would be like the, um, villages, the villages people. people. Oh shit. That's perfect. (laughs) He is the villages people. He is village people adjacent. He is the villages people in, in a, uh, American flag half shirt. Anyway, it, it all goes South and he moves, but it's, it's sad. I, I know my friend thought it was going to bring me some peace. It did not. It, it did not. So can, can we have a moment, please? We need a lot of moments <laughs> because you haven't even seen it and you're already traumatized. I'm traumatized. I am still trying to bleach my brain. <laughs> the, there's one semi good thing, a couple that have been together 47 years. And this woman has apparently the patience of Job. Her husband was, I guess, finding himself and and lost everything along the way. He was like meditating and taking a bunch of drugs. And I, you know, I don't care if you do pot, that's great. If you think it expands your horizons, phenomenal. I think he was doing something else, but he was apparently also doing cocaine. But at one point he is really out there and he gets a DUI and a ticket for having illegal drugs. And, and he appears in court and the judge is like, you're the most rude person I've ever had in my courtroom after all these years. And he was interrupting the judge and it's all like via video, whatever, but he pulls himself together and stops doing drugs. And it seems like he and his wife are doing well, but that's about the only positive thing here. I'm terrible. I'm so not, you know, a good movie reviewer. So yeah. What did your friend think you were going to gain from this depressing ass movie? I think she, you know, I, I, I'm going to call myself and I don't want to say this because I don't want to set myself up for this. I'm going to call myself the glass half empty girl. And I think she's the glass half full girl. Mm-hmm. I think she, she had already seen it. It had been a couple of years, but I think she 
she remembered the quote unquote happy part of the ending, which the guy that gets off drugs, but there's like a woman whose husband died and she wants to move back to Michigan really bad and she doesn't have the money. Mm -hmm. So she is working at an assisted living part of the villages and she hates it. And, but she's trying, she's out there joining groups and, you know, like what's it called? Line dancing. And, Mm -hmm. you know, she gets her hair done and her nails done. It just, to me, it was like, Oh God. I, I, My aunt's down in oh, Florida no oh, from in the villages. You know, she's not in the villages. Okay, good. So she's smart. Um, but you know, she talks about how there's a place for everyone. If you're a, if you're from yeah. Brooklyn, then there's the Brooklyn Club. If you're you right. know retired fire department people, there's a club for everything. And she you're right. freaking loves it. They went off some some little trip, some excursion. She's fiercely independent. She's you right. know, and she loves it. I think you just have to find the right place. Yeah. And the more of us that go there, the less DeSantis has power. <laughs> There's you definitely know? that. Just go down there and... You're right. I'm sure every state... Has has their people. Yeah, ha- has the pluses and the minuses. I get it. And one thing I do like about Florida is that it's there are not that many Florida natives. Florida is built up of, of immigrants and migrants from all over the country and the world. I get it. The same yeah. way California is. That's why it surprises me that they are they act as they do. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But. I don't either. You would think it would be a more broad base, but it it does seem to be holding on to some sort of old school. It's been a long time since I've been to Florida, which I'm grateful. And as a child, my grandfather had a little, a little bungalow in Pensacola, oh. which they call the Hillbilly Riviera. It's basically South Georgia. It's very much the Northern part of the state. And, you know, I, that was 50 years ago, so I don't know if it's still called the Hillbilly Riviera, but um, it's beautiful over there. I used to live in Fort Walton Beach. I love. Oh it wow! Mm-hmm. It was a lot of military. Yeah. Uh-huh. He he purchased the bungalow from the uh, family of um, friends of my mom's, and they wanted to sell it. And um, but the, he didn't keep it long either because he had um, a car with a vinyl top back in the 70s, a, a Grand Prix. Okay. Pontiac Grand Prix. And we went down one year and the vinyl top melted. <gasps> oh, wow. So that was a fun trip home in silence. <laughs> silence and no air conditioning. So, yeah, he uh, he sold the bungalow pretty much right away because the vinyl top melted down the side of the car. So that was good. Well, it'd be worth a fortune now. <laughs> I know. It was beautiful. It was red, half vinyl. It's uh, It was be- it was a pimp mobile. <laughs> big bench seats it was yeah but once it melted my grandpa was just pretty much out so all right so we've oh wait oh yes ma'am speaking of grandpas yes ma'am i have to give a shout out to my grandma i don't know if i mentioned this she is going to be turning 100 next month she is an amazing young vibrant woman yeah i wish to have the energy, mm. the still excitement, the still always picking up a new hobby. You know, her eyes have gone, aren't as good as they used to be. She used to love to read, but she's found like a thousand other hobbies that she can do. And it just, I don't know, it just amazes me and it encourages me to, you know, keep reinventing myself. That's and beautiful. Keep finding the zell in life because. Yeah. You, if you saw her, you wouldn't think certainly that she was a hundred. Right. And uh, she finally started walking with a cane, and, and oh my it's gosh, only literally because the family makes her in case, <laughs> you know, yeah. there's a crack in the sidewalk right? or you know something like that. But she walks just fine. She is. Oh my still, gosh. I always joke she still remembers my first boyfriend, and oh my that gosh. he drove a, a white Plymouth Valiant. I mean, she's <laughs> just amazing testament to living a, a is this cool... joyce's mom yeah this okay is, this is mommy's mom you yep. get this you get this naturally that's jeans. beautiful yeah <laughs> I get the you jeans. do i hope i i don't think my mind's gonna stay as good as hers though we can hope we can fingers, cr- fingers crossed <laughs> i yeah. mean her memory's already better than mine so yeah well maybe i mean but you know you can do crossword puzzles, something to keep yeah, it. She does. I mean, she does everything. That Arts reminds me, I have some, um, I have some diamond paintings for her. Oh, 
Oh, she loves them. I know. You told me yeah. and I forgot to get them for you. Yes, I do have them, them. upstairs. Okay, cool. I'll give you some. Thank you. You can pretend they're from you Thank for me. her birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Done. You are welcome. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, I do. I, I have a bunch of diamond paintings I ordered and I'm like, I'm not going to do these things. And you told me she liked them and I'm like, yeah. I got to give these to, to... It takes her forever because it's so tiny. Well, yeah. But she loves it. Well, that's beautiful. And then and then we hang them. And then you get, you get them done. And I mean, I have one I, I have in the back of my car. I'm taking a Michael's to be framed. Mark got me a, one of the last things he got me was the Christmas before, you know, he passed away was a gift card to Michael's. So I can get this giant skull framed. It's all glittery, shiny, iridescent, you know, and it has a big diamond in the middle of its forehead. I'm, I can't wait. I'm going to get it framed and hang it up. Nice. Yeah. That was my, probably my favorite, um, diamond painting because it was big. Mm -hmm. It's the little ones that make me want to, you know, take a diamond and shove it in my eyeball. So yeah, but I won't do that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this case, case, this case, and it's a solved one. So that, you know, sometimes I have to do that as a palette cleanser because open cases keep me up at night. Mm -hmm. And, uh, as I was getting ready for this one, um, one of my favorite detectives sent me another one and I'm about to punch him in the face. <laughs> um, I'm having lunch with him on Tuesday and I will be having a thousand questions for him because it's a missing person. Okay. And I'm like, how dare you? So this case was sent to us from, and I, I don't want to butcher her name. She said it's Cherokee and she said I could never pronounce it correctly. G-W-Y-L-E-N-N. How would you say that? G-W-Y-L-E-N-N. And it's Cherokee. I don't know. It's, it reminds me of those Irish names. Like I could never in my life have, per, have spelled Siobhan, mm-hmm. which is, you know, S-I-O-B-H-A-N. That's, oh. Yeah, that's Siobhan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So if I'm using that, which I shouldn't because it's Cherokee, not not Celtic, but Gwelyn? Gwelyn? Gwelyn. I think it might be Gwelyn. Anyway, she's a lovely human being who grew up in the area where I grew up and sent me several cases. She does not live there now. She lives in another state. But I think that cases from our hometown in Northern Kentucky still fascinate her. And this was one I had never heard of. Uh, it's a lovely woman named Shanessa Chappie. And she grew up in Taylor Mill, which is where I'm from. And she ended up moving to Clearwater, Florida, which is another wonderful part of Florida where the Scientologists have started to buy every block to turn it into like a Scientology town. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Clearwater is uh, very Scientology uh, centric. Mm. And she ended up meeting a very bad person. Now she's 24 and I, I believe they were, I've seen and heard two different things that they were living together and dating and that they were married. I don't think they were officially married and he's 37 and they're living together or in a relationship and she is working at a uh, dance club Now she had left northern kentucky because she had gotten past uh, a drug addiction and was wanting to get away from people she thought would influence her since she wanted a fresh start and one of the things that the lovely tipster mentioned is that she felt shanessa's family got a lot of crap because of, of Shanessa's age and that they weren't in constant contact with her. Mm -hmm. I think they tried. She had, you know, her parents were divorced, but they were both still loved her very much. Still, you know, lived in the Northern Kentucky area. She had two aunts. Her mom's sisters were very prevalent in her life. And, you know, she was 24. I understand that's young, but there comes a point when someone's, someone is an adult that you do the best you can to help them. You hope that they can figure things out for themselves. And she was hoping for a new start. You can't fix it for them. And they're probably not going to let you fix it. I used to think if someone had an addiction and loved someone enough that they could stop and that it's just not true. You have to stop for yourself. Yeah. No one can make you stop. No one, you can't stop for someone else. It has to be for you. I mean, that's, I used to think I had an an addictive personality, but I guess I don't. I assume if you're fat, you're a food addict and you're, that's not true. And 
many addicts have kindly tried to point out to me <laughs> that I'm not an addict. Mm. So, you know, I just, I would, you, you would want someone in pain to make a decision for you to live for you, but that's not going to happen. They have to make that decision for themselves. Mm. And I think Shanessa was young and newly sober mm -hmm. and thought she was doing the best thing by moving away from the people she thought were a bad influence and unfortunately landed with someone who was a worse influence. Wow. So he's a little older, like I said, and you know, you like to think maybe someone a little older, a little more worldly. No, I think he was, um, and you'll see his behavior. He was extremely childish and ridiculous. You know, being 35 and then eventually convicted at 37 doesn't mean you're an adult. He is so far from an adult. And she didn't know about his past behavior, which would have been good to know. And a point that her parents make is that he should not have even been out to do what he did to Shanessa. So she lives with William and she is working at a dance club. I don't think that's what she wanted to do, but she was a very beautiful young girl and that's what she was doing. And at some point, the communication between her and her family broke down. And I think they thought they were doing the right thing and letting her live her life, hoping that if something bad were going on, she would figure it out like she did the first time. Mm -hmm. But there's always that chance. And then the worst nightmare happens when someone calls you and says, we found your daughter buried in someone's backyard in a metal drum. Oh my gosh. Right. And here's what happened. William Rutenberg, who is, you know, as we've uh, figured out, not the smartest person. I do think it's fascinating that I believe it was her father was in court listening to what William Rutenberg was saying and said, I couldn't figure out if I was listening to a criminal mastermind or a complete idiot. And I think we figured out he's a complete idiot because he tries to defend himself in court. Oh, you mean he didn't have a lawyer? And he had three and fired them all. Oh. So... In 2011, they had an argument, and what he says happened, I'm going to guess didn't happen, but we'll get into that. And he calls a friend and says, hey, I have something heavy. I need you to help me move it. And his friend drives around with him with this metal drum, and they live in, you know, Pinellas County, Florida, and there should be lots of places like swamps to yeah. bury. Yeah. And they feel like they can't find any place. So William Rutenberg takes his friend home and says, Hey, help me carry this to the backyard. I'll bury it. And when they do, and he digs a hole in his own backyard, his friend notices there's hair with blood coming out of the top of the barrel. Mm. He says, Oh, you know what? I'll, I gotta, I gotta go. I'll be back. And goes directly to the sheriff's department and says, I'm not sure, but I think I helped my friend bury his girlfriend. Holy crap. And they show up and say, what happened here? And he's like, oh, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. And they find her and they're like, you know what? We had no reports of domestic violence. We had no report of a missing person, which is one of the things that the tipster wanted to point out is that her family couldn't have reported her missing because they were in an argument and they weren't talking to her right then. Right. So they acted like, that's the thing. I don't want this case to be pushed, you know, because she's a young girl from Northern Kentucky and was killed in Florida. I don't want this case to be forgotten because she was a lovely, sweet young girl that had friends and loved ones who cared about her, apparently had no beef with anyone, was just a kind, sweet girl. The most famous picture of her is in her red and white satin prom gown. And she just looks shy and beautiful and unaware of how beautiful she really is. Mm -hmm. But you can see the light in her eyes. And I don't know what happened that she ended up with an addiction problem, but you know, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You can have all the addictions in the world and you don't deserve to end up in a barrel buried in an asshole's backyard. So what we find out is that 
after he's arrested and indicted, and he says, <laughs> wait till you hear his defense. We find out that he should not have been out. He's brutally raped at the age of 14, an 11 year old girl in a shower. What? Brutally. How do you? He got out in 2002. I don't, I don't know how or why, but I can tell you that when he was um, convicted and given a sentence and the judge says to him, he was sent to a, a boys school. The judge says to him, you scare me to death. He's 14 and the judge says to him, you scare me to death. You're the scariest person I've had in my courtroom. And he's 14. Wow. 14 year old boy. So he was sentenced to this boys school, but he was released. Boys school? Mm -hmm. What? I'm sorry. What year is it? Dozier School for Boys, 1995. And he was given a sentence of life. Wow. And he was released in 2002. But he was on probation. Not a the, whole lot of time. Mm -hmm, the appeals court released him in 2002. So he's then 21, 22. And he had, you know, uh, several small run-ins with the police, but he was able, you know, to not do a lot of prison time. But he, this judge in 1995 obviously saw what was in, in front of him. Even in the form of a 14-year-old boy, he saw what was in front of him. And now we know, you know, uh, 10 years later, he murders, you know, a, a beautiful young girl that's his girlfriend. There are reports that he made her dance at the club mm -hmm. because he didn't have enough money. They are also saying that he got her back on drugs. Mm -hmm. And that was the point why her family was distancing themselves, hoping, you know, I don't want to say tough love, but you do what you have to do to try and keep your family member alive without being codependent and, you know, sitting on top of them and living their lives for them. Right. I don't want the family member to have a lot of shit come down on them either because, yeah, it, it just, some of us may be in that place. I know I've never been in that place, but I, I wouldn't know what to do. My first instinct would be to swoop in and try and save everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it just, that doesn't work. It's a Band-Aid. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe if you can Band-Aid it until they can put their own giant patch on, but you don't know that they're going to do that. And you don't know what time frame and you, they have to do it for themselves. They have to take off your bandaid and put on a much bigger bandage yeah. for themselves. So her father was in court listening to him represent himself after he fired three attorneys and said, I don't know if this guy's a genius or an idiot. And I think we can figure out he's an idiot. He's got a purple pen behind his ear. He's pacing back and forth, you know, in court. He's very, you know, uh, dramatic. And he's described as kind of a balding preacher with a goatee. And he clutches both sides of the lectern and, you know, kind of murmurs a few minutes before he starts talking. And he says, if somebody was in the process of committing a crime in your home, do you believe you have the right to defend yourself? I don't know that he ever got to say what he thought Shanessa was doing, mm -hmm. but I do know that he stabbed her in the throat. So I don't know what you need to defend yourself from with a 24 year old, small, frail, thin girl, but by stabbing her in the throat during uh, jury selection, you know, a couple of jurors were like, well, you know, exactly, you know, what do you, what do you mean? Defend yourself from what? You know, it depends, you know, I don't believe you have the right to take someone's life, you know, and, and here's William Rutenberg. He didn't sound very much like an attorney, even though he thought he was, but he's like, I, I feel like you have the right to defend your home and yourself. Every person who questioned him during jury selection was thrown out. And I will just tell you, it took one hour mm -hmm. for the jury to convict him one hour. Right. You know, people kept saying, I feel like it's foolish for you to defend yourself. Somebody who represents themselves is a fool. Mm -hmm. You know, one juror said, you can defend yourself, but it's going to sway me because I think this is not a wise decision for you. So all of those people were dismissed and the people that ended up staying and, you know, <laughs> And 
voted on his guilt. I can't even believe it took him an hour. I'll just say that, you know, um, that's because they serve lunch. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. that was four, 47 one. minutes of it, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you guys ready to vote? Yeah. All right. Let's get out of here. I love that in his summation, he said, I've been preparing for this for six days. And the district attorney says, I've been practicing law for 28 years. Yeah. So he was out, outclassed, you know, uh, by a little bit. And what is heartbreaking is that, you know, her body was flown back to Northern Kentucky where it, it was, you know, interred near her family. And her family is like, we can't believe this happened to her. We can't believe that this kind of a terrible thing happened to her and the fact that we didn't report her missing is we didn't know she was missing. Right. He didn't report her missing. There had been no domestic violence calls at the home. It was almost like he went from zero to a thousand and then tried to say it was him defending himself in his home. Mm -hmm. What is that? The uh, defending your castle kind of, yeah, I think Florida has that. Yeah. I mean, they, they have laws that allow you that, I mean, when I was growing up, you were told if you shoot somebody, Drag them over the least Drag line. them in the house. Mm -hmm. Make sure they fall in the house. Yep. If they fall outside. Yep. So, I mean, that's kind of yep. the way it is. I think that's very true. I mean, I have to tell you, I, I had a teacher that told me that in the seventh grade. If someone comes up to your front porch and threatens you, if you do something to them, drag them over the, he called it the lease line, but the line like your front door, mm -hmm. your entrance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's the country we live in, uh -huh. or at least parts of the country. Parts, parts of the country. And, and it still works. You know, you know, one of the things that bothers me is that I feel like there should be a series of laws or rules that govern the entire country. And I, lo I know a lot of people feel like things should be left up state to state. But I guess what I'm thinking of mostly are legal jurisdictions like if you've seen someone who's on the run you know and they get go to a different county or a different city then the you know they have to stop and let the other county take over i feel like there needs to be more you know inclusivity as far as let's all work together and, and as far as rules across the country either make it everyone has your stand your ground rule or nobody has your stand your ground rule everybody can shoot someone and then drag them into their house or nobody can do that you know i just I think that, you know, our country is huge. Right. And we don't much agree on anything. Right. I mean, once you get north of, where are we? Once you get past Ventura, right at Ventura County, for a good stress till you get from San, to San Francisco, you know, they're different worlds. Right. Just in this state. Right. No, you're right. So you can't really expect us to have common ground with I folks in right. Cincinnati. Right. No, I guess you're right. I mean, there are people that want to split California into three different states. I'm not sure, like Northern, Cal Northern California, Central California, and Southern California. And that actually was put up, you know, to be voted on. I, I feel like this, the state is already so separated. I don't know that that would make anything any better. Maybe it wouldn't make it worse, but I don't know that it would make it better. And, and I, I get what you're saying. You're right. I just feel like more things that are that we can all agree on, which I guess we'll never do. <laughs> yeah. I, it's way too big of a concept for me to get my head around for sure. But the fact that some states you can stand your ground and some states you can't, you know, and we're such a movable society now, mm -hmm. you know, you move, people don't buy a house and stay there for 30 years anymore. That doesn't, that's not, you know, that doesn't really happen. People yeah. don't keep the same jobs for a long time. I mean, you can and probably shouldn't. Yeah. It's nothing pays the way it used to. Right. You know, so. And if you find a place that honors you and, and values you, then, you know, you can stay as long as that you, you know, meet your needs. But yeah, people don't stay in, in jobs for 35, 40 years anymore and get a gold watch. Yeah. That doesn't, that doesn't happen much. This is funny. You said they serve lunch. It actually took 52 minutes. Mm. <laughs> 52 minutes to come back with, with a guilty verdict. And the judge said, you know, the most important thing that you have to consider in your deliberation is whether or not you believe that the state proved beyond a reasonable doubt that this was not self-defense. And I think the state 
probably didn't have to work that hard right. to prove that it was not self-defense. I mean, I feel like he's a complete narcissist. If someone is a sexual assaulter at, at the tender age of 14 and a judge says, you're the scariest person I've had in my courtroom, you are given a life sentence and you get out seven years later. I, I don't know how we don't know. Was the uh, jury privy to that information? Did that ever, I mean, I know a lot of stuff is inadmissible, but I right. wonder, I mean, it doesn't seem like they needed the information to convict him. It sounds like he was an idiot. I mean, once your friend sees right. hair and blood coming out of a barrel and you've been driving around with it and he helped you carry it around, you're done. There's, just kind of know, yeah. you know, stop wasting the state's money yeah. and just go ahead and plead to something that is not going to give you the electric chair. Right. You know, because he was 14, I don't know that it was admissible in this trial. And I know that his life sentence was thrown out by an appeals court. So maybe it wasn't admissible in this trial. It may have been brought up after. Mm -hmm. I think his Sentencing, family, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think her family was shocked. How was he even out at all? And, and it's easy to say that in hindsight and, and maybe Shanessa would have pulled everything together and not found someone who would have done this to her, but we'll never know. Yeah. It's difficult to say none of this would have happened if he had still been in prison, but there's also part of you that feels like none of this would have happened if he were still in prison. If a judge in 1995 sees a 14 year old boy who, whatever he did to this 11 year old girl made him say, you are the scariest person I have had in my courtroom. You scare me to death. A judge who's seen a lot of, I'm guessing more than one or two things, a judge in Florida who's seen one or two things that, you know, would prohibit them from saying that if a judge says that, I don't know how that's not weighted when it comes to a sentence a and given a life sentence for, for a rape. I mean, that to me, that guy's a hero. Well, I mean, you know, the, the problem is, and of course this is the new problem that's happening now. I don't know what happened, what was going on when he was released, but we're looking at these sentences, especially when it comes to kids and going, Hey, is it fair to sentence a 14 year old child to life in prison? And that's a valid question because I am certainly not who I was at 14. You're right. We right. change, we grow, we grow up. We understand consequences of our behavior Blah, 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 blah. My guy. And I'm not saying that the judge wasn't 100% right. Obviously he was because yeah. this guy went, went out. on to kill. Right. And who knows what he did and didn't get caught for. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because if he's finding young ladies who are vulnerable mm -hmm. and putting them in positions where they're more vulnerable, yes. he's probably destroyed a string of lives over that 10 year period. I think you're right. I don't think this is the first. It might have been the first that he either got caught or the first that he actually ended a life. But I think we can see a pattern here. You know, when you're 14 and you rape an 11 year old, you obviously want someone younger. It's a power thing. It isn't, you know, it That's isn't crazy. Right. I mean, at 14, you like, I don't even know what the processing is for something like that. Cause he mean, was a 14 year old predator. He attacked and raped her in a shower in a shower. It wasn't, you know, at a school dance or he, he is a, pre that's a predator. Yeah. Because it wasn't unisex shower. Right. He was probably watching, probably stalking, probably, right. you know, you have to know no one else is in there. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So my, I, I get what you're saying and I'm actually grateful that you're here because I think you add a balance to this because I have always been hang them high, Harry. I was a death penalty person for years until Mark Humphreys and a few other people pointed out to me, I can't in good conscience vote for a death penalty case because I don't know who has been executed, who is innocent. And I'm now, you know, in the other camp. I uh, feel like if the state brings enough evidence 
to keep you in prison for life until you can find someone, the Innocence Project or a pro bono attorney to, to help you, you know, prove that it's not you. Keeping you locked up for life, I can agree with. Ending your life makes me know better than you if you did not kill someone. Ending your life makes me a murderer. So I, I don't, I'm not a proponent of the death penalty anymore. I was always an eye for an eye. If you did this, then you need to suffer this. But you're right. You're a 14 year old person is different at 15, at 18, at 21, at 37. I and, get, I get and then it. there are monsters. And then there, yeah, are, and monsters. Then there are monsters. And I just and feel, I don't, yeah. I don't know who those monsters are. Right. And I think it's such. I think it's such a delicate balance when you look at issues of, you know, race, of class, of gender. Like there's so many things that cloud our ability to make a fair judgment. Absolutely. There's so many things that, I mean, if you've got the money. Right. I mean, we've seen this a half a dozen times over the past five years alone. If you come from a good family and your family's got enough money, you can rape whoever you want. That's right. That's right. And get it bounce down to a different, um, and get you know, patted yep. on the head and said, oh, sent on your way. Right. Boo boo made a mistake. Oh, poor baby. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know. It, I think it's difficult. You know, I, I used to wonder, they always talk about the jury of your peers oh. and I'm like, okay, if you want to do a jury of your peers then make it actual peers, <laughs> which I, won't work. I no longer believe in that. I'll tell you what I believe in Canada. And I'm not a you know big proponent of Canada. They have professional jury pools. We're never going to have a jury of our peers. We're right. all different and unique. What we fucking need are professional jury pools, people who understand the law. That'd be nice. I'd like to think I'm smart, but if I had to go and, and I'll listen to a specific type of case, I don't know that I would know all of the, you know, why do you think jurors send notes to the judge? You know, can we see this again? What does this mean? If you have professional jury pools who are picked, you know, who are paid by the state, by the country. Not not mm-hmm. sitting there going, oh my gosh, am I going to yes, get ma'am. fired from my job? Yes, ma'am. I'm only getting $100 for $5 a day. $5 a day. Mm-hmm. $5? Yeah, with $13. $13 $13 yep. a day yep. in California. Mm-hmm. That's what... The- LA County, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, 13 right. to 15, I think now. Let's get this over mm-hmm. with. Yeah. Yeah. He's guilty. I got to go. Yeah. If you... I, I love what Canada does. They also do not have the death penalty. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, also you know, have some health insurance, don't they? Never mind. We're probably, not getting into yeah, all that probably. stuff. And I think you can get, you can buy pot from them, uh, from the government. They deliver it to your house. Oh, cool. I, I, <laughs> I've heard that. Not that I, I'm just I saying. I don't, I don't partake, but you know. Yeah. If one who does, you can buy it from the government. You know, it's, you know. Uh, it's the good Clean. Shit. Yeah. You're not getting it out <laughs> off of like, you Ain't know, Ain't no Doo-Doo's fentanyl farm. in it. It's yeah, exactly. been dipped in formaldehyde. <laughs> <laughs> or it's not um, oregano. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that just burns your throat. I've heard. I don't know. Yeah, I think professional jury pools are phenomenal. That makes sense. I mean, because people who know the law, who are educated about the law, who care, and it's their fucking job. Because one of the biggest complaints in the OJ trial was, oh, those people, and all of a sudden, America got invested in who was on the jury. You know, I the types those of people poor that were on were the led. jury. Oh, no. I feel like those poor jurors were led... All I can say is, is his dream team did a great job. I don't Redid believe his house. in justice. I believe that you get the defense that you, you pay, can pay for. for. You're right. I mean, justice right. is based on how much you can afford. You're right. Yeah. And that's what's wrong with the system. Just one thing. You're right. You know, that's, that's just that's one thing wrong that's wrong. With, yeah, that's just one thing. Right. But, you know, I say I could never be on a jury. Do not ask me to be unbiased. There's no such thing. There's no the such thing. The second somebody walks down the street, you are assessing a whole bunch of stuff it's about them. It's human nature. That's the way we are. Exactly. That's how we survive. That's what we, how That's right. we know when to run. Avoid, yeah. <laughs> Flight, uh, freeze, <laughs> fawn, or fight. You're right. Yeah, by taking a look or at... Or thornicate. Come uh, well, here, Bubba. That's the fifth F. <laughs> Wow, I hadn't even thought about the fifth, the fifth F. Wow. Okay, now I have more things to think about. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let's I go just, back. Let's I just want to say this. Mm-hmm. Uh, in my mind, rape is a murder. You're murdering someone's soul. Oh yeah. They're never gonna survive that. I mean, they're gonna survive, but they're not ever gonna forget. And you have murdered a part of their soul. 
they may be a survivor and they may go on from there, but you have absolutely positively murdered a part of their soul. So I think rape should be, uh, you know, a conviction rate with murder. That's just me. Well, I think that, you know, the people that run things view rape differently. They do. There, you know, there should also be no statute of limitations on a rape case the same way there isn't with murder. There's a statute of limitations on rape and that, that should be completely obliterated from. Well, you know why? Well, you didn't, you didn't act like anything was wrong. You didn't say anything. You didn't call the police. Yeah. Why nine years later? Well, because it's the first time I could speak. The first time I could let it leave my body via words or my cells were holding onto it. Yeah. That's well, another hole. These are things that women understand that, you know, and I won't even say women understand. Cause I think, you know, we beat each other up sometimes more than men do. I think that's also you know? true. And, and I don't want people to beat up the memory of Shanessa Chappie. She did nothing to deserve what happened to her and her family loved her. They all loved her and wanted to be there for her and did the best they could. And that's, that's the important part. It's, it's terrible the way it turned out. And I hope that if you know someone who's struggling, that you can think or find a way to reach out to help them. And if you have a case, a missing persons case or an unsolved homicide that you want to suggest to us, like the terrible tipster, uh, Gwaylin, <laughs> who brought this terrible, terrible case to us. I'm just kidding. I love you and thank you for bringing it up. And look at the talk we've had today. Please give us a call at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837. Or email us at jttipsters at gmail.com. You can find us on any of our social media platforms. We have the Just the Tipsters Facebook page, Just the Tipsters on Instagram, JT Tipsters Pod on Twitter and our brand new website, justthetipsters.com. You can find us there. You can submit a case there. And we love hearing from you and more cowbell. <laughs>